and I'm going to try not to mess this up. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Julia Santucci, and I am the director of the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum here at the University of Pittsburgh, where I also serve on the faculty at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Really delighted that all of you could join us today. Um, just a few kind of quick announcements, and then I'd like to provide some introductory remarks about the woman who inspired the creation of the forum. Um, but before I do that, uh, just quickly, we want you to know this is a completely compostable event, so everything can be composted. There are compost bins in the back, uh, hoping to contribute to Pitt's sustainability goals here. Um, I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank Dr. Michael Kenny and the Matthew B. Ridgway Center for International Security Studies for co-sponsoring this event. I think uh, the events of the last several months and several years have really shown us why responsible leadership is important in the security sector, so I'm really delighted that we can partner with Michael. Um, I'd also like to thank Doreen Hernandez, Sandy Monteverde, and our team of students at the Hesselbein Forum and the Ridgeway Center for all of their work to plan this event and organize it for us. And then, most importantly, before I introduce our speaker today, I just want to provide some remarks about the woman who inspired the forum, Frances Hesselbein. Um, so the forum is the namesake of Frances Hesselbein, who grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and in 1932 enrolled at the University of Pittsburgh campus there. She did not complete her degree at Pitt, but in her lifetime, she received 22 honorary doctoral degrees including one from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, where I now serve on the faculty. Frances began her career as a volunteer Girl Scout troop leader, um, which is somewhat notable because she had a son and no daughters, but still stepped into this role to support her community. And she went on to become the CEO of the organization, the Girl Scouts of the USA, where she transformed and diversified the organization. For this work, she was awarded our nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, by President Bill Clinton. Just days after retiring from the Girl Scouts, she founded a nonprofit organization whose mission was to strengthen the leadership of the social sector through publications, events, and programs. In 2017, she partnered with the University of Pittsburgh to evolve her organization into the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum here at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. So our mission at the forum is to develop and inspire current and future leaders. We do this by publishing the most contemporary views on leadership in the award-winning Leader to Leader Journal. We support graduate students and undergraduates through leadership development training and coaching. We gather students, faculty, staff, and the greater community uh, to leadership lectures through this program, the Hesselbein Lecture Series. Frances also partnered with the university library system to create the Frances Hesselbein Papers, which is a repository of her life's work. And my colleagues, Ed and David, are in the back with some um, items from that collection. So after the lecture, I would encourage you to stop by and see uh, what they've brought for us today. And there's much, much more um, in our repository at the archives, which we look forward to showing off at future events um, and around campus. So Frances passed away in late 2022 at the young age of 107. And throughout her long and incredible career, she maintained a commitment to values-based leadership that continues to inspire people throughout the world. Her mantra or her battle cry, as she would refer to it, was to serve is to live. Her commitment to public service began when she was a child, when her family instilled in her the value of taking care of others. In her book, My Life in Leadership, she writes, quote, we are responsible for others, responsible for family, friends, the whole community, society, and in the end, democracy. To Francis, public service could take many forms and happen in any sector. She had a particular affinity for those who serve in one of our nation's most demanding institutions, the US military. From 2009 to 2011, she served as the class of 1951 chair for the study of leadership at the US Military Academy at West Point. Um, this is notable because she was the first woman and the first non-graduate to serve in this position. She served as a trusted advisor and counselor to many of our country's top military leaders, including our current Secretary of Defense. Frances also believed in innovation. 
When she took over as CEO of the Girl Scouts in 1976, the organization was losing members. She recognized that while the Girl Scouts' mission was highly relevant, to develop girls into competent women, its approach was outdated. Rather than focus on preparing girls for marriage, the Girl Scouts needed to focus on preparing girls for a future in today's world. They instituted a new focus on math proficiency and STEM fields and shifted away from traditional merit badges like sewing. By making the organization relevant to more girls, the membership numbers improved tremendously during her tenure and continued to improve after she departed in 1990. Finally, Frances maintained a lifelong commitment to diversity. When I visited her office in 2019, she proudly displayed a photograph of her Girl Scout troop in Johnstown in 1953, in which black women served in leadership roles at a time when the city was still heavily segregated. As CEO, she focused on expanding the Girl Scouts' reach to non-white girls, including by making its logo and handbook more inclusive. During her tenure, diverse representation more than tripled within the Girl Scouts. So it's not hyperbole to say that Frances' long life of service impacted millions of people, many of whom may not have ever known her personally. I share something in common with today's speaker, and that we both were touched by Frances far before we ever came to know her as Girl Scouts. Shannon Huffman Paulson has written that participating in the Brownies introduced her to the concept of service above self and to wearing a uniform. She would go on to wear the uniform of the United States Army, in which she served for over a decade. During her Army career, Shannon became one of the first women to fly the Apache helicopter, leading line units on three continents. After her military career, Shannon earned an MBA from Dartmouth's Tuck School and later her MFA. She went on to lead outstanding teams in the corporate world, in the medical device industry, and at Microsoft. Shannon Huffman Paulson is the author of The Grit Factor, Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World, as well as the memoir, North of Hope. She is the founder of the Grit Institute, a leadership institute committed to whole leader development and host of the Grit Factor podcast. She also teaches on the faculty of the Tuck School Leadership and Strategic Initiative Executive Education Program. Shannon, we're really delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Julia. It is really a true honor to be with this esteemed group of people in both the ballroom and online today, and an honor to be in Pittsburgh for the very first time. My mother is actually from Pittsburgh originally. Uh, I just heard this morning from the neighborhood of Westview. And she lived here for seven years before the family moved to Kansas. So that's my, my Pittsburgh connection, but this is my very first visit. So thank you for being such wonderful hosts. It's a particular honor to be here knowing the story, the legacy of Frances Hesselbein and of her mentor, Peter Drucker, as well as your previous esteemed speakers. And I truly believe, as Frances did, that to serve is to live. And I want to talk to you today about how it is that we find the grit and resilience and the energy to continue to serve for the long haul. One thing that I know for sure is that inside each one of us is a deep longing to contribute our absolute best to this world. And the other thing that I know for sure is that our world needs you and you and you and you and all of us to do exactly that. The first day that I walked out on the flight line towards the Apache helicopter that I was going to fly was a winter day in Alabama. The sun wasn't quite up over the horizon, and I had my flight suit jacket zipped up against the cold. I walked out on the flight line towards that helicopter, and I saw it crouching there looking like an enormous praying mantis lined up next to all the other Apaches also crouching there. The Apache is 58 feet long. It's 12 feet high. It's 18 feet across. On its nose hangs three different sight systems that see in day and night and adverse conditions. 
On its wings hangs any combination of the 2.75 inch folding fin aerial rocket and the anti-tank Hellfire missile. Under its belly is slung the 30 millimeter high explosive cannon. It's the most technologically advanced and lethal helicopter in the world. I walked out on the tarmac on that winter morning towards that Apache and I thought, who am I to fly this thing? I was an English major in college. <laughs> And right there on the tarmac, on that winter morning, I had to make a decision. I had to decide to be better than any of the doubts that I was feeling. I had to decide to be better than any of the doubts that I was hearing expressed around me about why women think they need to fly this thing anyway. I had to decide right there on the tarmac, on that winter morning, that I was going to own my own story that I was going to take control of my own narrative. Because who was I not to fly that thing? So I walked up to that aircraft, I put one foot up onto the wheel, the other foot up onto the Ford avionics bay, and I opened that all glass cockpit that opens up and out like a Lamborghini. Now I've never been in a Lamborghini, but who needs to if you get to fly that thing anyway? I reached inside, swung myself into that front seat, lowered myself down, attached the five-point harness, and began the run-up procedure that I would know so well that I would know it by heart, but I would always use the checklist. The power levers advance, the rotors come to full RPM, release the brakes, and then we taxi out towards takeoff. Now who here knows which way you take off in the Apache helicopter? Come on. It's only lunchtime, you can't be tired yet. Which way? Up, up is a good guess. Up is ultimately the end goal. In the Apache helicopter, like in any other aircraft, you turn the nose to face the wind. And when you use it the right way, the resistance will help you to rise. Remember that, there's a pop quiz at the end. In the Apache, like in any other aircraft, you turn the nose to face the wind. And when you use it the right way, the resistance will help you to rise. I just came here today from South Carolina where I had a chance to speak to a private company that, um, about grit and resilience. And we're gonna go deeper than I had a chance to do with them today. We're gonna go into really the foundations of grit and resilience. But I wanna give you kind of the, the introductory piece of this as well before we go a little bit deeper into some of the research behind it. Starting with walking out on that tarmac was the very beginning of a, what would become a very long journey that ultimately brought me here to you today. And it really brought me ultimately, you know, through three different continents, leading multiple different line companies, working in the corporate world. And then I had a young leader reach out to me and ask if I would mentor her as she began that same journey that I had taken a number of years before. Now I immediately said yes, and then I started to doubt myself again because it had been a while since I had served in uniform at that point. And my integration into an all-male field was surely somewhat unique. So I wondered how I could scale what I offered to this young leader, and if I did that work, how I could find a way to bring it to leaders like you, and you, and you, and this entire room, and anybody who's watching as well, as you go along your leadership journeys. And that became a project that ultimately turned into the grit factor, interviewing over several years leaders in the vanguards of their fields. They happened to be women, and they happened to be military. Every single one of them faced what Stanford law professor Deborah Rode called the double crucible. Both the incredible challenges of the job at hand, in addition to working in oftentimes hostile or otherwise uninviting work environments. These are general officers from across the services. There's aviators from World War II to the present, there's a Navy submariner, there's a combat rescue swimmer from the Coast Guard, one of the first women Army Rangers, and many, many more. And 201, they shared their stories and their lessons learned incredibly generously. And what came out of those lessons and stories, in addition to doing the secondary research and the most, the most forward-thinking leadership and management, is what I now call the Grit Institute Triad. And what the triad suggests, and the book is laid out in exactly this way in these three sections, is that grit is not this discrete sort of a thing that we take off the shelf for mile 23 of the marathon, although it's very helpful there as well. But grit is really more of the fabric of who it is that we are. And that grit triad breaks out 
and we're going to focus on the foundation today, but it breaks out into a foundation that I call the commit phase. That's about you making the commitment to owning your own story and connecting to what I like to call core purpose or heart purpose. This is where we're going to spend most of our time today. But as you go on and read the rest of the book, you'll see the next leg is learn. And learn is about deep engagement in the present. So once you've owned the past, then we're deeply engaged in the present. That deep engagement in the present is about building your own team and taking care of your team, most importantly, because it's all about people. It's about the art and science of active listening, and it's about the mindset of success, which we may or may not have time to touch on today. Finally, we launch with that groundedness in the past, that deep engagement in the present, and we launch with audacity, the willingness to take risks, the willingness to face failure, the willingness to show up authentically as ourselves, but not at the expense of culture, and adaptability, the willingness and the ability to shift as circumstances change, which is something that we've all had to learn quite a bit about over the last three years. That's the Grit Institute triad. So really it's more than just this discrete thing. It's not just about muscling through, although there are times when that's helpful and necessary, but it's really a much more holistic concept. So where do you start? Where do you start with this idea of grit and resilience? Well, 201, the leaders that I spoke with and interviewed for the grit factor, 201 understood that the most important story was where they had to start. Now, the most important story was not yet the one of the organization. It wasn't yet the passion of national security or homeland security or whatever your area of focus is. The most important story is the one that you tell yourself. Now, I had to learn that a number of years before walking out on the tarmac. When I was still a senior at Duke University and I was an ROTC cadet, I was drilling with the National Guard as part of my scholarship. And towards the end of my senior year, I drove out to the state aviation office to receive my assignment for the years ahead. I reported to a colonel that sat behind a desk that seemed as wide as this room with shiny plate glass windows going up behind him. And I stood at attention and tried not to shake. And I saluted. And he asked me to sit down. And we exchanged a couple of pleasantries back and forth before the interchange that I would never forget. When he stopped mid-sentence, looked down his nose at me, and said, you realize, cadet, that you will never fly an attack aircraft. Well, I looked back at him, and I recognized his comment in the moment for what it was meant to be, which was small and mean and cutting, because in the spring of 1993, attack aircraft weren't open for women to fly. But I looked back at him, also realizing that there were some times that you say, yes, sir. So I said, yes, sir. And I drove back to the campus of Duke University to the ROTC detachment and requested a transfer out of the National Guard and onto active duty. Now, later that spring, Congress changed the game on that colonel and on everybody else, lifting the combat exclusion clause, and suddenly every aircraft in the inventory was open to women and men to fly, and I thought that the sky was the limit. I reported later that year to Fort Rucker, Alabama for the Aviation Officer Basic Course and Flight School. Include here a picture of our graduating class, and the front row are the honor grads. And I made very sure that there would be a skirt in that front row. <laughs> so I asked for and I earned the opportunity to transition into the AH-64A Apache attack helicopter. And I took my very first duty assignment at Fort Bragg, now called Fort Liberty, North Carolina, at the 229th Attack Aviation Regiment. I was part of the 3rd of the 229th. I went there ready to fly, ready to lead, ready to learn. And I was ready for that first platoon, that first leadership position that every young leader needs to be able to prove or at least learn about leadership. And I was assigned not to that platoon that was necessary for leadership development, but instead to a back office staff position as the assistant to the assistant operations officer, typing up the appendices to operations orders. And I did the best job I could. I got great feedback on my work, and I went to the captain I was working for, and I said, sir, I'm going to keep doing the best job I can at the work I've been given, but I wonder when that platoon's going to open up. And he looked at me and he said, Lieutenant, the Army doesn't owe you anything. And I realized with a pang that I had done the work, that I had earned the opportunity, and that I may not be able to influence the outcome. So I kept doing the best job I could at the work I was given, 
And a couple of weeks later, the major that we all worked for, that's above a captain for anyone who doesn't have the military background, but the major we all worked for had us all come into work on a Saturday for no apparent reason. I like to say that the Army doesn't have HR in quite the same way as other places. And I remember we were all sitting at our desks doing our work, and he looked over at me partway through the day, and he said, don't worry, Lieutenant, you'll be married by the time you're 25. Yeah, right? When people don't gasp, I worry a bit <laughs> about that entire group. Uh, and I, I didn't say yes, sir, then, because I wasn't there to get married. I was there to fly and fight the Apache helicopter. I was there to be an aviation leader. So I went to see him that next week. And I said, sir, I'm going to keep doing the best job I can at the work I've been given, but I think I can do more. And he looked at me a little bit surprised, and he gave me one additional duty after another, and I made sure that I hit every single one of them out of the park, and finally I took that first flight platoon. Now, I tell you that story for a couple of reasons. Number one, if at any point I had decided to take somebody else's version of what my story was and what my narrative was and how I could contribute, I would have stopped dead in the water. I've told you a couple of these examples. I could give you at least a dozen more in that same period of time. So you have to start by owning your own story. You also have to ask for what you want. Major General Don Dunlop that I had the honor to interview for The Grit Factor says she tells every young leader, never assume anybody knows what it is that you want. You have to ask for it. Of course, you have to earn it, right? You have to earn it. <laughs> and then you have to ask for it. And you may have to ask for it more than once. Every opportunity that I had in the military, I had to earn and I had to ask for usually more than once. So don't be dissuaded by the fact that it isn't served up to you on a platter. It never really is. You have to ask for it. Now the next part of this though gets into the second part and the, really the foundational piece of what I'm hoping to, that I can leave with you today and, and cover today. And that is working on the second part of this commit phase. Now the more that I get into the, the research, the more that I get into the stories, the more important this becomes. And that is making the decision to become purpose-built. And I'm going to talk to you about what I mean by that in just a moment. Owning your story is the first step. The next step of this commit phase, and this is this deep internal work, right? This isn't yet external work, is becoming purpose-built. Now, it's hard a little bit to talk about purpose. I'm going to get into some of the details in just, just a moment. But, but really, the place that I like to start with talking about this, and this is part of a program that I run through the GRIT Institute, is borrowing a technique to go deeper than why. All of you have probably heard about starting with why. It's a great place to start. The problem and the danger of that is that most of us end with asking why. And it doesn't go nearly far enough. So I want to suggest that we borrow what will seem to be somewhat randomly, a manufacturing technique that was developed by Toyota a while ago to drill down to the root cause of deficiency. And that is asking why not one time, but five times. We have to peel back the onion for ourselves. This is not yet your organization. This is not yet your team. This is just for you. This is deep internal work. And every single one of you in this room has got to spend the time doing it for yourself. So you peel back the onion. So let me give you the example. I'm sitting, I'm working in this, this operations office, not flying the Apache, not doing the work that I thought that I was there to do. Well, why was I there? Or, well, I was there because uh, I was an Apache helicopter pilot. I was there to fly and fight the Apache helicopter. Okay, why? Well, I was trained to do so. Why? I had asked for, I'd earned that opportunity. Why? Because I wanted to serve my country. That's pretty good, right? But it's not far enough. Force yourself to drill down to at least the fifth level why. And I'm gonna, the way that you can assess that you've gone deep enough is that you've gone to a place and you get to a place that is agnostic of the job and agnostic of the organization. That's really hard when you're committed to national service and national security and all those things, right? Agnostic of the job, agnostic of the organization. So why? Well, I was there to serve. Service was how I was brought up in my hometown of Anchorage, Alaska, where at our church we made food for people who didn't have enough and we delivered meals on Christmas Eve before we went home to our own. That was a part of who I was and how I was raised in the world. So you get down to the values level that is unique to you. The purpose that we want to talk about today is about values moving into action. Values moving into action. That's the level of purpose that is ultimately 
unbelievably powerful in a way that you cannot even begin to imagine. So now let's get into some of where some of this new work is coming from. And I tell you another story, and this is backing up into my time in the military because, you know, that it was really an, it was an honor to have served. I hope you'll hear that from any of us who have worn the uniform. I know you will, and, and any of us who are working for the betterment of our country and, our, and the security of our world, which is many of you in this room, so thank you. But I really, when I think about what was really important about that time, and I can, you know, there's some cool, sexy, fun, flying stories, but we're not going to talk about those today. We're going to talk about what really matters. And I want to give you the example of one of the first weekends when I was in Korea. I was assigned to Half Attack, 1-2 Aviation, the most forward deployed attack helicopter battalion on the Korean Peninsula. We were 10 kilometers south of the DMZ in the city of Chuncheon. And I was there initially as a logistics officer and then ultimately took a company command. But one of those very first weekends, I took the train from Chuncheon into Seoul. Now that's a two hour ride on the train. Uh, it, this is sort of what a train station might look like. It's also what the train happened to look like because it was one of these very inexpensive local trains where people just jam in. So it's not just about finding your assigned seats. It's about just trying to find enough space for your body, however it is that you can find it. And I took that train down to Seoul, wandered around a couple of the markets in Seoul, got back on the train and came back up to Chuncheon. Now on my way back up to Chuncheon, I was lucky enough to get a seat. I had an old man sitting next to me who'd had a lot of soju, which was um, the case a lot of times on a weekend in Korea, and uh, fell asleep. he fell asleep on my shoulder and I just sat there and tried not to move. And then I got up and was very much looking forward to getting off of the train um, and, and onto the station and then back onto our very small base. But before I could do that, a very small little lady who came up to about here on me grabbed my hand and held it very tightly. Now I had just arrived in country and, and the briefings that I had received included things like people aren't always happy about us being in Korea and sometimes there are people that protest and I just thought, oh my gosh. And I was the only Caucasian anywhere in sight and the only person in the military anywhere in sight. And I couldn't do anything to release myself because I was hemmed in with everybody else. And this little old lady held my hand and held my hand and we kind of moved in this, this kind of mass of humanity off of the train and onto the station platform. People began to disperse a little bit, but she continued to hold my hand and then grabbed my hand with her other hand. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is happening here? And then she looked up into my face and a couple of her family members were standing with her and her face was creased with the years and she had tears streaming down her face. And I, it was usually assumed because I was a woman that I was a teacher. So I kind of got off scot-free on, on some things. But she looked up at me and she said, UGI, UGI, like, are you a GI? And I said, yes. And she said, and held my hand with both of her hands. Korean War, thank you, GI. Korean War, thank you, GI. And I get chills thinking about this. I didn't earn that thank you. Other people had earned it well before my time. But that sense of purpose, that sense of serving something greater than myself, than ourselves in a way that required potentially the supreme sacrifice and did require that of many people is a really unique and important thing. And I think, I believe, that that is what every single one of us needs to be connected to. Now in 2001, in August of 2001, I left the service. And I had been stationed at El Paso, Texas, at Fort Bliss, my last duty assignment. And I drove away on a flat Texas highway towards New Hampshire where I would start graduate school. I had a goal. I was in graduate school. I was going to be doing something new. I was going to be finding a new world. I had a goal. But I think I had that nagging feeling then, and it would only get worse, that I didn't have a purpose. I had lost that purpose. This is a place where a lot of transitioning veterans find themselves, and it's a huge crisis in our veteran community. It's not just veterans, of course, it's any of us who are making transitions at different points, but in particular, when we're in a very insular environment with such an intense feeling of purpose, sometimes borrowed, sometimes given, but certainly owned, 
it's a very difficult transition to make. So I arrived in New Hampshire, started my MBA program at the Tuck School at Dartmouth, started to do the spreadsheet jockeying and the accounting and things that uh, really I had no idea what it was that I was doing. And then the towers fell. Do you all remember where you were when the towers fell? Some of you probably haven't been born. <laughs> uh, but for those of you who had, it's not a day that we'll ever forget. I was in a decision science class, which was learning how to do Excel modeling, something that I'm very bad at and was very bad at then. And um, nobody came to our class to tell us. They let the class finish. And I remember leaving that class and walking down the hallway and seeing people coming towards us that were, some of them were running, some of them were walking, but they were crying openly. And I was like, what, what is happening? And then there was a classroom that was open with stadium seating on one side of the hallway where the news was playing on this huge screen. And a few of us veered off and sat down in silence and watched the news. And I had this thought that it was like that old radio show that my parents used to play for us on long car trips of the War of the Worlds. I was like, is this a movie? Is, I mean, what, I didn't understand what was happening at all. And as that reality settled in, you know, it prompted many of you, perhaps, many people to service. But I had just left the service. I no longer had a purpose. I no longer had a way to serve at a time when I felt that service was needed. I remember that the next day that the campus was quiet and I drove to the entrance of the Tuck School, which is, you know, big white columns on a big brick building, if you ever have been up to the campus in Hanover. And I put a single candle on the Tuck steps with a printed out picture of the American flag. I think there were a lot of things that people didn't know how to do, right? They didn't know how on a campus they were allowed to respond immediately, and they didn't, other people responded immediately in different ways, but, but there wasn't any response initially, and so I put that single candle there with a printed out picture of that flag, and I think of it still as this single and solitary flame of, of hope and of sadness and of having lost something really important personally and collectively, right? It was, in a sense, a quiet and a lonely prayer, the single flame that flickers and burned into the darkness. And I think that is where a lot of us and many people still find themselves today, this many years later, not just because of that experience, but because of that experience and what has happened in the wake of that experience. We're now mourning the loss of systems or ideas or institutions where we used to have a greater trust than we do today. And we don't know what else is going to fill that void. We're realizing perhaps that we were looking in the wrong places to begin for this idea of purpose. And I think this understanding is a deep sadness, but it is also a great opportunity. When the management consulting firm of McKinsey studied the workforce in the midst of and then in the wake of the pandemic, trying to find some factor or factors that was influencing this unprecedented resignation, right? The great resignation, this great reshuffling, how, the great reassessment, however it is that you wanted to understand it, as well as the mental health crises and the physical health crises that did not come from the pandemic. All of this has been decades, literally, in the making. And McKinsey went and studied that to look for a factor or factors, and they found something very, very interesting which I, I, I think is, is where we're going to spend most of the rest of our time here today, which is that it is the loss of and the lack of connection to the individual sense of purpose that is in large part to blame for what it is that we have seen in the workforce and what it is that we're seeing in our numbers for employee engagement, what it is that we're seeing in our mental health epidemic and potentially even reaching into the physical space as well. It's utterly fascinating and it's, in a sense, not surprising because, again, this has been somewhat decades in the making and before September 11th even as well. This isn't about organizational purpose. Organizational purpose is a good and an important thing. And I think the rise in B Corps and the rise in, in our focus on sustainability and in other really important areas is an excellent thing. But it's not enough 
to have the organizational purpose. And this is where this becomes particularly a leadership issue. Because we have to ourselves take the responsibility and as leaders take the responsibility to help our people connect to their own individual sense of purpose first. And this is what I mean by becoming purpose built. Because if you have your organization here, your organization is run by people. And if your organization is purpose built, but your people aren't connected to their, their own sense of purpose, that's that metaphor, right, of shifting sand. And the organization can't stand, and the organizations aren't standing, because we have to be connected to that individual sense of purpose, in addition to building our organizations in a way that are, is reflective of that same focus on purpose. It is an incredible opportunity. So I want you to take just a moment and think. Let's back up a little bit to story. Think about where you are on a scale of one to 10 with understanding and owning your own story. You don't have to share it. Just think of where you are on that scale. Now think about where you might be if you were to move yourself up that scale a couple of points. Now think about where you would be as an organization or a team if those who worked for you owned their own stories. It's a profound change and a profound shift in how it is that we work. One of the things that I know for sure is that every single one of us has the responsibility and the opportunity to take the raw material of our lives. Some of it we, we think we've earned, although we're all very blessed and so I think we should probably question that as well. We think we've earned, we think we've asked for, some of it we never would have asked for in a million years. But every one of us has the opportunity and responsibility to take that raw material and craft it in the direction that you are meant to contribute in this world. And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. How are you meant to contribute in this world? The answer might change over time, that's okay. Purpose is a nuanced and can be somewhat of a fluid thing over time with changing circumstances. But you are meant to contribute in this world and it's every single person's responsibility to figure out exactly how. So that's what we're missing. We're missing the sense of purpose because you know, we're fighting a lot. We're fighting modern understandings of psychology that many people are now questioning, many psychologists are now questioning. We're fighting the capital markets, we're fighting capitalism and, and more. And I'm not saying any of those things are bad, but none of them help you to find your purpose because we're quite literally, from a business perspective, bought into the idea that it's all about us, right? And modern psychology has told us it's all about us. And it comes actually from a very interesting misunderstanding, what well, comes probably from before that, but it comes from an interesting misunderstanding of something that probably many of you are familiar with. And I wanna just bring it up here because I wanna absolutely destroy this misunderstanding if you are one of the most of us who have had it. And that is going back to Maslow. Anybody ever seen this pyramid? My, you know, do you know that this pyramid is, is, is fake? Did you know that? He never drew that pyramid. It is in nowhere in his writings. Now the research does in fact identify these all being needs, but they're not necessarily hierarchical. They're not necessarily leading one into the other. And in fact, Maslow's later work suggested specifically that that's not the case. So we're gonna blow that up. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't do self-esteem because you haven't focused on physiological needs. That's not what the research says. But that is where the research has gone with that misunderstanding in the decades since. And that's one of the reasons that I think we have a problem today. Here's Maslow's actual theory. His actual theory, which of course continued to develop over the course of his life, is that there are basic needs that we all have. But, and some of the research suggests that part of the change in his direction was prompted by a conversation with his friend, Viktor Frankl, who said, you know what? When we were in the concentration camps, we didn't have all of our physiological needs met. We didn't have our safety and security met. We didn't have our self-esteem met. We didn't have love and belonging met, but we were able to transcend that. And this is where the power is, is in his later work, which is something that all of us, I hope, will take into the world. And that is, yes, we all do have a suite of things that, that ideally we have if we are healthy and, 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 uh, and contributive people in the world. 
This idea of self-actualization, which is typically shown at the tip of Maslow's pyramid and is in pretty much all of our understanding of how it is that we show up in the world, right? How do I self-actualize? How do I become the person I am supposed to be? That is the wrong focus. And that is not what Maslow suggested in his research. What he suggested in his research was that self-actualization, just like happiness, is not something that can be reached if you aim for it. Self-actualization is only reached as a bridge to transcendence. And transcendence or transcending the self, going beyond the self serving, right? To serve is to live. To transcend the self in service of the greater good, it is only by doing that that you can become self-actualized. It's a very, very important distinction. Now this is something that Maslow actually ended up calling theories Theory Z, and it was in response to his colleague McGregor at MIT who had Theory X and Theory Y about management, we won't get into that, but Theory Z says we are meant to transcend ourselves. The ego is meant to go away. We are here to serve a greater good. We are here to serve a greater purpose. And I believe, and I'm guessing that you do too, that that's what we're all here to do that that's what we have this longing to do. We need to go from here to something like that, yeah? We need to get beyond ourselves. It's an angst-ridden place to be stuck on ourselves and worried about ourselves all the time, right? It is not an angst-ridden place to be focused on serving the common good. This is where our systems have failed completely because we're aiming for ourselves and that bar is simply too low. We're aiming for self-actualization, thinking that that's the peak, but that bar is too low. We can't attain happiness by striving for happiness. We attain happiness as a byproduct of doing meaningful work. And that's the same thing with self-actualization. We find ourselves through serving others. And to become purpose-built, it's important for not just each of us, but for leaders to prioritize what goes into the corporate enterprise, what it's made up of, and it's made up of people. As we become more and more technologically advanced, as our world moves forward with rapidly expanding opportunities and capabilities and things like AI, which can be sometimes frightening. I have hope for the future of our organizations and for our future, because when we focus on what's human, and what's human is to discover that we are human by transcending that peace, there is so much good that will come in this world. I wanna just focus back briefly on this idea of leadership. One of the things that's important to remember is that leaders are not defined by their rank or their position or by the number of direct reports they have or by the size of their P&L. A leader is a person who has made the decision to make a difference, who has committed themselves to being outstanding and who has decided to lead. You can lead from any seat that you sit in. And a leader has to decide ultimately to take care of the people that are around them, whether or not you're responsible for them. My very first promotion to first lieutenant, I remember, I'll give you one more story here, was a back office of the battalion headquarters. It you know, wasn't a big ceremony. My dad happened to be down in North Carolina, which almost never happened. And so my very first battalion commander and my father stood on either side of me and pinned on those silver bars of the first lieutenant. Very first promotion in the army. And my battalion commander said words that I share now in every single presentation because if you're a leader, you must internalize this. And he said, the only good use of any increased power that you will ever have is the increased responsibility to take care of your people. And I learned from him that leadership was a sacred trust. And one of the things that we learned well in the military is that when you take care of your people, and that means there's sometimes some tough love, right? That doesn't mean there's no accountability. There's absolutely accountability. When you take care of your people, your people take care of the mission. That's what a leader's job is to do. And so if purpose 
is as powerful as I'm suggesting that it is, as powerful as I think that you probably also believe that it is, it is a leader's responsibility to do the work not only for yourself, but for your people. And if as a leader you believe that you are connected to your own purpose, you can't let up on this at all, because statistically speaking, in those same McKinsey studies, a leader or director is much more likely to be connected to his or her sense of purpose than their people are. The people on the front lines are much less connected. So you've got to do that work to know your people, to spend time with them, and to help them to do the work to connect to their own purpose. And if you're one of the people working for one of those leaders, you're lucky. It's your responsibility, it's not anyone else's. So although it's the leader's responsibility, it's also each one of ours in leading ourselves. So what if we did that work? What if we did the work of helping people connect to their individual purposes? Well, the studies from McKinsey are utterly and completely compelling. This connects directly to longevity at a job. It connects to our engagement, which has been in the pits for a very long time, connects directly to employee engagement, connects directly to employee performance. It connects directly to mental health, to physical health, and to relational health at home and at work. Imagine for just a moment how things could be different if we did that work. Think for just a moment where you are on that scale of one to 10 with connecting to your own personal purpose. Think about how different it would be if you moved up just a couple of points. That's why this is some of the work that we do at the Grid Institute is approaching purpose in multiple different ways, through ancient ways and through modern ways, because there are many different ways to come at this all-important attribute. It's important work that we go deeper than why. It's a great place to start with that question of why. But we have to go deeper to do the work that we are meant to do. I want to just close with one comment about our veterans, because this is a particularly difficult thing for our transitioning veterans. And this is work around purpose that we do at the Grid Institute that I'm hoping to bring into the veteran community. It's work that I know is transformative regardless of the community. I've run this, this course now in various manifestations at the Tuck School, at the Next Step program for transitioning veterans and, and transitioning Olympic athletes who actually also have a, a similar challenge. And I want to give you the feedback from one person who reached out to me on LinkedIn only one week into the program. And he sent me a note, and he was a lieutenant colonel in the military. He deployed several times. And he said, you know, one week in, you have transformed me. He said, I'd begun to think of my life and my future through the lens of my limitations. But I'm starting to understand now that I can look at things through the lens of possibility. One of the things that's important about purpose and about story and about many things that we won't have time to talk about today is that you have the opportunity to make the decision yourself. Which lens will you look at your life through? Will you look at it through the lens of limitation or will you look through the lens of possibility? Will you look through the lens of opportunity? There's one more quote that I wanted to leave you with that comes from Viktor Frankl. He uh, was speaking about his time in the concentration camp. He said there were people in the camps that said, what do I have to live for? What is there to live for anymore? Maybe they lost family as Viktor Frankl had lost family. Maybe they had just lost hope. Maybe they had lost physical faculties or other. And this is what Frankl said. He said, it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. We needed to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead to think of ourselves as those who were being questioned by life, daily and hourly. Our answer must consist, not in talk and mediation, but in right action and right conduct. I like to think that Francis would probably agree with that. To serve is to live, to transcend ourselves through owning our stories, through connecting to our purpose and becoming as organizations and as individuals and as teams purpose built. That's the work of the commit phase of the grit factor. What would it do for our communities if we did that? 
So what would it do for you? The answer to all of this is, as Frankel said, not in the talking and the mediation, although that's also important. The answer to purpose and to becoming purpose-built is in the action. The answer to purpose is in our commitment and our movement towards that purpose. It's not a destination. It is a movement toward connecting both as individuals and as organizations to something that makes the world better. We contribute our best to the world when we commit to going deeper than why. So let's come together and craft a future for ourselves, for our teams, for our families, for our communities, and for our organizations that is purpose-built. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Shannon, for that, that wonderful set of remarks. Um, as you can tell, um, Shannon Huffman Paulson is a storyteller. I think she did a wonderful job of conveying her ideas about leadership, grit, and resilience through storytelling. And I'm glad you got a chance to experience that because that's what she does in the book. Uh, it's a wonderful book that tells stories based on your life and your incredible experience uh, in the military and, and elsewhere um, to, to lay out um, your vision of, of leadership. So just so many things that I take away from the talk, um, the, the importance of maintaining that sense of purpose and always mm. asking, you know, why, you know, not just once, but, but many times, the, the five, asking five times, um, aiming not for, aiming for transcendence as opposed to self-actualization. Um, leaders decide to lead and how you can lead from any seat at the table. I thought that was fantastic. And finally, leaders take care of your people and then your people take care of, of the mission. So just absolutely a wonderful set of, of principles and things for us to think about with leadership. Um, my name is Michael Kenny. I'm the director of the Matthew B. Ridgway Center for International Security Studies and delighted to be your moderator for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, and I have some, some questions here that I'm gonna ask our guests. You know, we have some, some questions from the floor as well. So let me start, if I might, um, with the question that um, I think many of us here in, in the room today, and you kind of alluded to this, Shannon, that it's, uh, there's some pretty you know, scary things happening mm. in the world these days, you know, looking out at the Middle East, uh, the Far East, you know, the situations, the attacks that the U.S. is under, the U.S. military is under yes. from, from numerous both state and non-state adversaries. When we read the news today and, and we look out and see all these things happening, it can be hard not to be overwhelmed with the problems yes. that our country faces, that our world faces. Our students are in a somewhat unique position of having to absorb all this while preparing for their careers, while preparing for their leadership roles. Yes. And so the question I have is how can our students prepare for careers of, of impact without burning out, you mm. know? What, how can they foster resilience from, from the get-go and so achieve their sense of purpose, not just for the next year or two, but over the length of their careers? Yeah, that's a great question. There is so much happening in the world, no matter where you sit, but certainly for all of you in this room who are particularly engaged in, in this area of focus, uh, especially for you. And we are all grateful now and into the future for your careers, I will say, because they'll be necessary for us. Uh, I think the most important thing is to stay focused on where you are right now. Uh, be present for where you are right now. Uh, don't, don't focus on those things that you don't have control over, but focus on those things that you do have control over and do your absolute best work in that space. 
And if you can make that your focus, I think you reduce anxiety, you also increase your own performance and your own contribution to a place that we all need you to really perform and contribute, so thank you again. Uh, but, um, but I think that's important, is, is to come back to the place where, where your focus is and where your work is and do your absolute best work, and, uh, and the rest will follow. Excellent, yeah. great, great response. For our next question, I'd like to go to, to the audience. I know someone uh, has, has a question for us. I'm gonna go ahead and call on one of our, our second year students, uh, Ms. Kathleen Brett, please. Thank you so much, Shannon, for your words. We really appreciate it. I guess my question, you touched on a little bit at the beginning, but do you have any advice for uh, women entering male-dominated fields? You know, you talked about your career in the military, but those of us that are going into the workforce, if you have any advice, um, love to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, I think the advice would be very similar. I, my work in uh, the corporate world after the military was also in technology, so both the medical device industries as well as at Microsoft, and both of those are not as male-dominated as the military, but, uh, but, but they get close in some places. And, and I think the advice is, is somewhat similar to the answer to Dr. Kenny's question, which is really, especially as you first arrive, Stay a little heads down and do outstanding work. And when you do outstanding work, when you produce excellent results, there is very little that anybody can say. And, uh, and it could be that you won't have any issues at all, by the way, there are wonderful people that you can work with across industries. But uh, in the event that there are environments that are less friendly, I think doing exceptional work is the foundation to your success no matter what. Uh, the second part of that it really is finding your allies and having friends maybe that are outside the workplace or family members at home, uh, whoever it is that you, can, that you can talk to when you need to talk to them about something being challenging. Having potentially a colleague that is not necessarily in your office but maybe in an associated field who will understand the kinds of things you're going through and maybe able to give some tactical advice or feedback. Uh, and then looking over time, and, and I know we talked this morning, but um, I never was fortunate to have a formal mentor, but if you can find somebody who's willing to be in a mentorship role, that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And th that will be somebody who offers more strategic advice for the direction of your career, maybe, and, and addressing something than, than the more tactical advice. But kind of building that team is a really important thing so that you know that you're not alone. And none of us do it alone. And that's an important thing to remember that uh, you don't have to do it alone. So. Excellent question, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Let me continue with another question. Um, in the book you write, and also the stories you were telling us about your experience of being a woman in the most male-dominated institution in the world, um, you know, as the father of a budding engineer, yes. I can relate to that because my daughter is finding out what it means to be a woman in a very male-dominated world. And the question that I want to ask you is, um, you know, one challenge that, that many women um, face is, has to do, I mean, I hate to say it, but the reality is, um, you know, work cultures that tolerate sexual harassment and yeah. abuse. Yeah. What you know, what do you tell a young woman who is, is struggling uh, in that space? And that's the first question. The second question is, what should leaders of any gender yes. in such institutions be doing to ensure that that doesn't happen, to ensure that there's accountability when it does happen, and to prevent gender-based violence? This is an important and an unfortunate question, and I keep thinking the longer that we're here, the less necessary it will be, and unfortunately, that doesn't seem to change. Um, and it, I'm gonna start actually with speaking to the men, because the men in the room are actually the ones who have the chance to solve this problem, not because you're part of that cohort that is, that is hopefully perpetrating violence, but, or not hopefully, but that you're hopefully not part of that cohort, but because we need men to be allies in this issue. And men have got to be willing to step up and call people out for harassment or inappropriate behavior. Full stop. Th that's, I like to think that's what a gentleman would do. It's what I think any man should do. It's how I'm bringing up my children, I hope, my two boys, that, that, that they will also be willing to do that. So men have got to be allies, number one. Um, I'm gonna ap approach the women actually at the end. The second piece, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this as well, if you are a leader, 
you must have a zero tolerance policy. And if it is a star performer that is, perform that is acting in this way, that person is out, period. So first of all, you articulate the policies. You set the policies and you articulate the policies and you vocally support those po the, the policies that you put in place. And then you act on those policies. And there are no exceptions. And when you create a culture of absolutely non-negotiable good behavior, you'll find, as a leader, that you've set that culture. And that culture will prevail. You might lose somebody once or twice, maybe, maybe, uh, hopefully not. But if you have a star performer that is the sexual harasser, that person must go. And they must go immediately. And it must be a, a very obvious and uh, uh, public sort of a thing. So I'm very, very strong on that. Um, if you are a woman who is facing this, I'm sorry. Um, many of you who are women in here will face that. There may be men who face that as well, by the way. Uh, I think there's, there's actually some recent news to that effect. There, all of you in this room may have the unfortunate um, experience of this kind of misbehavior. And what I would say is to feel confident in immediately rebuffing it, right? Immediately say, this makes me feel uncomfortable, I need to leave. And, uh, and if this is something that doesn't stop immediately, then you need to find another place to work. It might be another team, it might be another person. I would also suggest that there, you'll have to judge this, and this is where I would talk to a colleague or a mentor or, or HR, if it's actual harassment, um, where you need to file a report as well. And those are unfortunate things if they get to that place. I also want to um, add a word of caution, which is that you're going to hear things that are inappropriate, you're, and I'm not defending those things in any way, but I would say you also, as young people, need to learn to pick your battles. So you don't want to go in there with your, your, your dander up and your boxing gloves on. You want to go in there and just perform and be exceptional, full stop. And be careful about the battles that you pick. There's a line that is crossed with harassment, and you're going to have to decide for yourself where that line is, all of our actions have consequences, for better or for worse, and so be thoughtful about that. But um, uh, th it's a very unfortunate thing that this continues to exist in, in some of our workplaces. And at the end of the day, it is a leadership issue, and leaders, leaders must have a zero tolerance policy on this, full stop. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to go back to the floor for our, our next question. Uh, I see a hand over here, if we can get her. I don't reject, all right. Well, hi. Um, and maybe begin by identifying yourself. Yeah, the, I'm uh, Rachel. I am a poli sci major here at Penn. I'm a second year, so kind of young. Um, but I want, it's kind of a fun question, kind of a hard right. But you said earlier you did Girl Scouts. I was just wondering what level of Girl Scouts did you stop at? And if you ever would be a troop leader in the future. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry to say that I think I started and ended with brownies, um, but, uh, but uh, clearly, I'm very proud to say that in this room. And uh, what I'm working on right now is working on setting up Boy Scouts, actually, in our community, because I will also say, as important it is to develop girls, it is also very important to develop boys, and boys right now are being left behind in a way that, frankly, our policymakers and our educators are not recognizing. And so boys right now are behind girls by more percentage points than girls were behind boys prior to Title IX. So we have to have things in place to take care of raising good men, those good men who will be allies and who will be able to be, we should be equal participants in this world, not not one over the other. And so to be quite frank, my focus right now is on Boy Scouts and on boys, um, but I am a tireless advocate for girls, and I think, frankly, all of us need the opportunity to contribute our best selves. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. We have time for at least one more from, from the floor. Anyone have? I see someone. In there. Yes. Again. Identify yourself, ask your question. Hi, my name is Layla Bani Hashemi. I'm a faculty member here at, at the university. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I'm in the School of Medicine, so that's a soft money environment, and we, we get our we fund our labs through federal grants. And I find it so challenging to both do the deep work and scholarship that it takes to, you know, create these projects and to manage the team that's leading the studies. So my question is really, how do you lead you know, compassionately the way that you describe taking care of your people while your focus is divided on you know, keeping the lights on in your lab? 
Hmm. That is an excellent question, and that is the job of a leader. <laughs> um, and it's very hard work, and it's very lonely work a lot of the time. Um, it gives of yourself in, in more ways than a job, than, than just a regular job might give, yeah? Um, and so I think what I would say to that is that you, you know that both of those have to be somewhat equally important. Uh, you have to do the work to take care of yourself so that you can manage those responsibilities. I think a lot of leaders get themselves burned out because they're working so hard in both of those areas, right? And I'm sure, as I heard some stories last night at dinner too, uh, the challenges of that in academia are something I don't have personal experience with, but I understand are quite challenging. So I think key to this is managing yourself and your own energy so that you can give your absolute 110% to, to both of those areas of responsibility. And I know that it's not both, it's really myriad, right? Uh, so manage yourself, manage your own energy, take care of yourself, ask for help when you need to ask for help. And, uh, and know then as you plan your days and your weeks and your months and your years, ask yourself, am I putting adequate energy into both of these areas? Am I both getting the funding that we need to be able to do our work in addition to doing the development work that I need to do for my team? Um, am I connecting often enough with my team? Am I having those kind of conversations that I need to have? How can I continue to get better? And I, I'm a big, big believer in continuous improvement. I think we can always get better every single day at what it is that we do. My son doesn't like to hear that as I give him feedback on his essays, but I say you can always get better. And, uh, and so ask yourself that in your own self-assessment and your own planning every week. You know, how am I handling these major, these big rocks, as Covey would say, right, of my responsibilities? Uh, and then how am I also handling that big rock of taking care of myself so that I can sustain that effort? So thank you for that question and for your work. Thank you for the question. Another wonderful response. I would now love to invite up the Dean of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, Dr. Carissa Slaughterback, to deliver some closing remarks. After her remarks, uh, Shannon is going to be signing copies of, of the book, so you'll want to stick around for that. Dr. Slaughterback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was amazing. I can't wait to get a copy of the book. And as a leader um, in one of the schools at Pitt, I was taking lots of notes and taking some inspiration in a challenging week and a challenging environment that I think a lot of leaders face these days. So definitely taking a lot away. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Kenny, um, for facilitating. And thank you to a really amazing audience. I know we have students here. We have faculty we have staff, we have members of the community, and it's really wonderful that we can all come together in this space, reflect on leadership, have conversations together, and I hope we can continue to interact in this space as I wrap up our session today. Um, the comments that, the guests, that our guests shared today align really, really perfectly with the focus of our school on preparing students for lives in service to others. And I really love so much the focus on heart and on purpose and on caring for others in this work, regardless of what role you're in. Um, it's truly um, what's needed in order to do this work well. We have to be here as our whole selves, bringing our whole selves, bringing our whole hearts, and truly our commitment to others. We train students in our School of Public and International Affairs for careers, and I often say when I talk about that, it's about careers, but it's also about lives. Again, we are preparing students as humans, as people, to do this work, to do work in organizations, on particular issues, but to do this work in communities and together and as individuals. And I think really thinking about how we're shaping our educational offerings, how we're shaping our professional development, how we're shaping this university to be able to prepare students to work, to interact in that way. At Gispia, we're especially proud to host the Hesselbein Leadership Forum um, and continue to uphold the mission that um, Frances gave us through her incredible body of work. What we're focused on with the Hesselbein Forum, and I'll say this extends to our GISBR School of Public and International Affairs as well, is developing and inspiring current and future leaders. It's a particular privilege for us to carry forward Frances's legacy of leadership, including her unique and impactful conception of leadership that centers values, and again, we've heard about this throughout the day, and service to others. 
She has demonstrated that throughout her career, through her words, through her engagement with others, and really in all aspects of her life. That leadership is much more than leadership positions and the formality of roles that we might hold. You hit on this so perfectly, Shannon, when you said a leader is a person who has made a decision to make a difference. Wherever we are, in whatever role, whether we're a student, whether we're a dean, whether we're somewhere else within this university or community or organization, it's about a decision about who you are, what you are going to take on, and what you're willing to do, not just for yourself, but for other people. So thank you for that reminder and for just carrying this vision that Francis gave us forward. We really appreciate it. Again, Francis Hesselbein helped all of us to understand that leadership is really personal and an act of love. And we don't talk about love enough in organizations. And it's an act of caring for others. This approach, and especially this understanding of leadership, animates our work at the Hesselbein Forum and in our school as we prepare the next generation of public service leaders. So again, I'll close with thank yous. Thank you so much to the Hesselbein Leadership Forum for hosting this event and also our co-sponsor, the Matthew B. Ridgway Center for International Security Studies, both in the School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you to excellent staff at the William Pitt Union for supporting our event today. And thank you again to our guest, um, Shannon Huffman Polson, and to each of you for being here today. We'll conclude again, as um, Dr. Kenny noted, with a book signing in the lobby outside. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I'm so proud.